we are live on Facebook and I'm hitting the record button. Welcome everybody. We are just waiting for uh, people to get admitted from the waiting room and we will get started momentarily. We're excited to have you all here. We have a great evening planned. What's happening here? Um, Daniel, there is uh, someone on. Um, I'm going to pause the recording for a minute. Um, Daniel, there's a participant who just says David. I think that might be our, our keynote speaker. Can you allow him to be on video and unmute? <laughs> yes, are we looking at just David? Um, I changed it actually so that um, everyone should be able to unmute themselves. Oh, and there he is. Are we all set? I think we're all set. Okay. Dr. Pate? Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank, thank you for being here. We're going to get started in one second. I'm just going to hit record and then we will start. Welcome everybody. We are delighted to have you all join us for Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice Annual Celebration. I'm Rabbi Bonnie Margulis. I'm the Executive Director of Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice. Um, we are based in Madison, but we are a statewide organization. And as people of faith who are committed to justice for all peoples, we acknowledge that we are situated on the indigenous lands of the Menominee, Ojibwa, Chippewa, Ho-Chunk, Winnebago, Potawatomi, Sauk and Meskwaki, Kickapoo, and other nations who cherish this place. We make this acknowledgement to honor the history, culture, traditions, and rich legacy of the native peoples who've lived here and continue to live here and contribute to our society. We further make this acknowledgement as one small piece of ongoing efforts to end the erasure of their contributions and of the true history of how the United States was formed. We will continue to lift up Native American rights and issues in our work and to reach out in allyship with the indigenous nations in Wisconsin. For more information and resources on how you can help support this work, please see the newest blog that's on our website. Our event this evening is our annual fundraiser. Our goal tonight is to raise $10,000 to expand our reach around the state and specifically to hire a regional organizer in the Milwaukee area. And we'll say more about that later this evening. But right now I am delighted to turn uh, the mic, the virtual mic as it were, over to Adam Clausen, senior leader of the Life Center in Madison and one of Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice's uh, treasured uh, board members. Adam, I turn it over to you for our opening blessing. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor and pleasure to be uh, with all of you. So thank you for joining. You uh, would you just, uh, however you like to reflect and uh, get in a contemplative uh, place and space um, as I just open this up. Gracious God and, and creator of uh, all life and goodness, uh, I just give you thanks for this assembly of people as we celebrate unity in and through uh, our diversity, um, for the opportunities that we have uh, have had in the past and in the future to speak and to serve uh, towards 
and just a more just community and world. Uh, we join our hearts with gratitude uh, for the vision and the faithful advocacy that this uh, Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice staff and leaders as board uh, and the generous and faithful supporters have exhibited. Uh, these past uh, 15 months have uh, humbled the universal race of humanity uh, when we stared soberly at the just undeniable uh, inequities uh, of our global family. Uh, regardless of faith or creed, all were impacted uh, by something that was invisible to the naked eye. Yet it was because of uh, our respective invisible faith uh, that we have virtually convened through the airways and mobilized in innovative ways, uh, continuing the advocacy uh, for justice and equity on the earth uh, for our regions and our country's most vulnerable uh, and harmed. Uh, faith in the divine, uh, in the sacred, uh, seen or unseen, um, has just compelled all of us to pursue progress towards uh, a greater common good. Uh, so there are things that uh, humanity has deemed sacred throughout history. Uh, there are things that you, as the divine have deemed sacred and this fight for love to be expressed through empowerment and removal of systemic barriers is something that we all agree is sacred and worthy of courageous advocacy. So may we all receive greater grace to experience more wonder, more mercy, more justice, and more love. May peace and goodwill towards all creation be our pursuit as we all pull together this next year. Amen. 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 Thank you, Adam. Uh, I am so excited to introduce our first presenter to you, um, Professor Li Chao Ping. Uh, I'm going to get, give very short introductions to our presenters, not because they are not amazing people, but because they are amazing people. And I want to give them as much time as possible and not take up the time with lengthy introductions. Uh, Li Chao Ping is the Sally Baines Professor of Dance uh, and Vilas Research Professor at UW Madison and Artistic Director of Li Chao Ping Dance. Uh, she was named by the Dance Magazine as one of the 25 to watch and makes work for the stage, screen, and other sites for individuals and organizations around the country. Known for her originality, trademark physicality, humanism, and visual design, Li Chaoping creates layered works that combine multiple art forms to explore themes of culture and identity. As a performer, Dance Magazine said Li Chaoping's, uh, Li Chaoping in performance is a case of the dancer transcending the dance. When Chaoping is on stage, you don't want to blink. So I'm going to turn it over to Chao Ping now. So everybody, please don't blink. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I want to mm -hmm. make sure I muted myself. Um, my name is Li Chao Ping, and I'm truly, truly grateful for this honor to join you all today. I am, um, I'm a choreographer and a dancer, as you said. Um, I also often write texts for my dances. Um, I teach at UW-Madison and I'm also the artistic director of my company, which is based here in Dane County. Um, I began teaching at UW-Madison in the dance department in 1993, and I was the first Asian person to not only be given a tenure track position in the department, but also to receive tenure in the department. Um, today, I am sharing parts of two works that I have made, one in uh, 2012 and one in 2017. Um, both reflect some of my perspectives about my family stories, my cultural heritage growing up in San Francisco, and becoming aware of my otherness. I, uh, When I was growing up, I was quite confused about my identity, and I thought, or I was taught, that assimilation was the key uh, to fitting in and the path to truly being accepted or to be successful. Um, I didn't realize what I was not taught. And at the time, I didn't know what I had absorbed um, about not belonging, 
needing to prove myself time and time again, or that my voice or my value was not equal to others, um, and so many other lessons. The, my first major work was a 40-minute solo work I made in 1991 called Yellow River, and since that time, I have been delving uh, deeper and deeper into the spheres of politics, race, gender, age, disability, colonialism, power, and class. Um, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy the two works that I'll be showing tonight. Um, Daniel, could you maybe start it again? The audio is missing. Yes, sorry about that. Thank you. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I've discovered that sometimes the journey is neither straight nor short. from China to the U.S. by ship. It was 1950. He was 23. And the second of four sons. Here's what I know. Thank you. 
Chinese. He existed in the in between. This is where he landed. This was home. Thank you so much, Jeping. That was beautiful and, and powerful, and we really appreciate your sharing your work with us. 
Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm introducing now our keynote speaker um, and we are uh, delighted uh, to have him with us to share his important work with us. Dr. David Pate Jr. is chair and associate professor at the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare at UW-Milwaukee. Dr. Pate is an expert on low-income African-American men, fatherhood, and child support. Dr. Pate studies how Black men are affected by the social welfare system and the challenges that impede their ability to attain economic security. Dr. Pate also serves as advisor to PBS Wisconsin series, Why Race Matters. And we invited him to uh, be with us here tonight to share some of his work with us. Dr. Pate, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you and good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to be invited to be your keynote speaker. I feel that's always an honor and I always uh, have wanted to be a keynote. And this year I happen to be keynote three times. So I must be doing something right. So thank you so much to Bonnie for inviting me, uh, Rabbi Bonnie. Uh, I wanna also thank Daniel for the IT um, in terms of making sure that we, you can hear me. And um, Professor Ping, your dance expression was absolutely beautiful and very, um, um, very emotionally uh, fulfilling for me. And Adam, thank you for your prayer. I know that your theme tonight is let's pull together Harambe. And um, when I talked to Rabbi Bonnie about what should I talk about, she mentioned my work and um, what I've been doing with uh, PBS around the Why Mat Race Matters uh, conversation. So I wanted to start out with a reading from one of the, uh, someone I really uh, admire. Uh, Charles Mills, who is a professor at UIC, is also a philosopher, and he has a book called Black Visible, Blackness Visible. Um, but I want to start with a short reading from his uh, chapter three of his book, But What Are You Really? The Metaphysics of Race. Uh, race has, been, has not traditionally been seen as an interesting or worthy subject of investigation for white Western philosophers, though it has, of course, been the central preoccupation of Black intellectuals in the West. Such sporadic discussions as have taken place in white Anglo-American philosophy have usually re revolved around moral issues, for example, the debates from the 70s onward about the rights and wrongs of affirmative action, but race raises an interesting metaphysical issues as well in terms of who and what we are that can also properly be seen as philosophical and that deserve more analysis than they have usually received. The modern world has been profoundly affected by race for several centuries, not merely in the United States and the Americas with their history of Aborigine exploration and African slavery, but more broadly through the shaping of the planet as a whole by European colonialism. So when we think about the whole idea of race, as many of you already know, and if you don't, race is a social construction. Race was created um, in terms of American ideas of race being black and white, it was created as, Hannah Nicole, as Nicole Hannah Jones will say, with the initial enslavement of black people from Africa, there had to be a decision made on the hierarchy of race as to how we would view race. And when you look at poverty and racial justice, it's important for us all to decide how we're gonna make choices and how we're gonna present those present that information. But also as someone who teaches social welfare policy at UW-Milwaukee, one of the things I tell my social work students is that in 1604 with the Elizabethan poor laws, we decided very early on in our, in our, well, in our being of who we are, of who's deserving, who's undeserving. And that whole idea of undeserving and deserving uh, populations or groups of people or categories of people was decided when people came to America, they decided to um, take land and col col colonize this particular land and categorically decide who was acceptable and who was eligible. And this laid the foundation for what we know as meritocracy as a foundation for wealth building. We have all been experiencing since COVID the unfortunate death of George Floyd that unarmed Black men and women are being killed by police, as well as Latino and Latina and Asian citizens are being killed um, by those who have either hate or dislike or fear of those who are different than the majority. One thing that we heard a lot last year also was that this is not America. But unfortunately, we need to really examine the historical trauma, a definition coined by Maria Yellowhead Braveheart uh, in terms of what does that mean? It means multi-generational trauma experience by a specific cultural, racial, or ethnic group. It is, 
excuse me, is related to major events that oppress the particular group of people because of their status. And as someone, when I teach, one of the major topics of discussion right now that's been coming out in this country is this whole idea um, as how do we examine this country or if, if we are examining this country or are we teaching this issue called this whole theoretical issue, theoretical base um, of critical race theory. And for me, critical race theory definitely provides a lens of and a way of looking at this is America. As you, if you didn't know, critical race theory was developed by UW Madison legal scholars and colleagues. And there, when you look at critical race theory, you're looking at the relationship between race racism and power. And the basic components of critical race theory is that racism is ordinary, that the entrance, there is interest conversion, which, the, which means those who have the majority power are gonna maintain their interests at any cost. And then also we're looking at how is race constructed? And because no one is born black and no one is born white, some of you're generally born according to your ethnicity, ethnicity or your historical um, cultural uh, well-being. You, you, but race in terms of white and black is something that has been created by America. And we also, have the, and also when you're looking at critical race theory, you're looking at what role has the government play, played in either maintaining segregation, discrimination, oppression, and an inability to access wealth. And there's a number of examples, particularly as you look at black people um, in particular, there's a number of examples and I can go for others too, but um, focusing on blacks for this moment, there was a whole idea of chattel slavery in 1647 that was instituted into law by the government. There was hereditary law in 1662. There was 1857, the Dred Scott decision in terms of there was a separate class of people that blacks were some, somewhat different than whites and they weren't fully a full human. There was a Homestead Act of 1862 that said if you stayed on this land for five years, everyone except those who were Black who were, who were um, in this country, as well as if you were Latino or if you were an Asian person at this time, at that time in this country, but if you identified as white, you were able to be taken advantage of them called the Homestead Act. Also in this country, we had three different amendments that specifically pertain to those who are Black. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, slavery. The 14th Amendment allowed the right to be seen as a citizen if you were born in this country. And the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote. We also had a thing, something called the Freemans Bureau in 1865, which was the very first social welfare program for those who were black, because at this time, black people who had been formerly enslaved had no rights, but they also needed social welfare services. We also had in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, which maintained the separate but equal look of black versus white and anyone else who was non-white. Non and then in 1934, as recently as 1934, we had a whole something called the uh, Federal Housing Administration, which denied the access of housing to anyone, primarily blacks, who were not seen, who were not given a mortgage. Uh, and it's also the creation of redlining. So the government has been very involved in maintaining what we see as, an issue, as issues around um, discrimination and oppression, and this is this historical facts, but all of this can be seen through the lens of when you do a critical race theoretical approach to looking at what's going on. One thing that happened most recently in Wisconsin is that the Wisconsin Medical Journal um, had a recent special issue on the impact of race and racism on health, and it highlighted specific issues to that was um, that were definitely affect where people who were Latino or Native American or Black um, Asian as well, um, not very many Asians, but some Asian look, or Southeast Asian, um, were looked at in terms of their health status and looked at how race and racism has a total impact on their health. But nationally, if you look at this whole idea of how does race and racism impact people who are black and brown, um, death rate is three times higher for those who are black and brown, particularly black citizens than their white counterparts. And if you read David Williams and uh, Professor, Professor Williams and Professor Dorothy Roberts, you can learn a lot about that. Every seven minutes, a black person dies prematurely in America, or 200 black people die daily based to their lack of access to services. So when you bring up this term, why does race matter? This is just a few examples over, if you look at a historical uh, lens, or if you look at just the current situation and where we are right now, race matters very much as a discussion in this country, um, particularly at this point in time of where we are. 
Um, when you look at income for blacks, blacks earn 59 cents for every $1 earned by what to whites. And if you think about wealth and wealth is not what you bring home in your daily, in your monthly or weekly or annual salary, but wealth is, do you have a home? Do you have a second home? Do you have any kind of stocks and bonds? Wealth for blacks is six cents to the dollar for whites. And it's not much better for anyone who is not white in this country. Whites live longer than blacks, for example, even when they, uh, well, for example, whites graduated from high school live longer than those with a college degree, depending on your race. And that goes for those who are Latino as well as those who are black and Native Americans as well. And we have found over time that discrimination um, contributes to and, and everyday examples of discrimination. For example, if someone portrays you that they're afraid of you, that has an effect on a person's body and can relate to their blood pressure. Or if you get stopped by the police for a minor or subtle or in subtle ways, you get stopped by the police. That causes some issues on your blood pressure as well. Um, it is known that over policing of, for communities of color leads to higher disproportionate arrest rates. And if you didn't know it, Wisconsin has one of the highest rates of incarceration for black men in the country. And even most recently, we, a study came out that found that half of white medical trainees believe such myths as black people have thicker skin or are less sensitive or have less sensitive nerve endings than white people and don't need as much pain medication as soon as the, a black a white person would need. And most, and most recently, if you look at why race matters and why the project, the project that I was involved in had to happen, nationwide blacks had died at 1.4 times the rates of white people during COVID. The next group was Native Americans who died at 1.3 times the rate of white people. And then you had Latinos who were 1.2. So black and brown people, and again, why race matters is really important here as a discussion. We also discovered that of all the groups who lost the most males um, during COVID, uh, black men were hollowed out from 20, those black, the groups of black men who were 25 to 44 with the highest number of by gender and race who died as a result of COVID-19. So again, the, the issues of why we talk about why we need to have these, these various ways of dealing with issues of race and why we decided to do this project called Why, why Race Matters um, was because we really felt it was important to bring to, the, the, to, Matt, to Wisconsin um, so a, a beginning of a discussion of why, why race matters. Race matters for all the reasons I gave you, but race also matters because of the fact that we need to figure out in our collective ways, what do we mean uh, when we say we want to do right? When we say we want to build a better world, what does it mean, so if, we, what does it mean if we have not taken the time to examine our life and, if we, and, and decide what's, what's next? Because when we don't examine our life and when we don't look and do it, when we don't decide to do any real critical analysis, we just won't grow. We just won't be in a space where we can help out our fellow person. We won't be in a space where we can decide that what we see is wrong or right. And also we have to make some hard decisions. Um, I know I was asked to give you some answers as part of this conversation, um, but we, the, the, the answers are, 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 are hard answers. Um, I'm not usually someone who, who has answers, but I have many friends who do have answers, so at least they provide answers. But one of the things I did come across in preparing for this talk is one of the things that's going to really require us to be in a better space where everyone has the same access to the same issues around wealth and well-being is that we have to be willing to share the abundance of wealth that we have in this country. America is one of the richest countries in the world and maintains that status. And right now we're very, we're very engaged through our current president in providing many of the vials that are needed for people to um, be vaccinated against COVID. And we need to be, and that, that type of sharing of the abundance needs to even go beyond the fact that many people who have lived in spaces where they have not been acknowledged, where they have not been given the same, been given the same opportunities are never gonna do that until we decide that in this capitalistic environment that we live in, that we need to be able to be willing to give up some of the power, give up some of the wealth, give up some of the space that we have so that everyone has the same access to a safe home, safe property, a, a good school, um, food every night. Um, one of the biggest issues that happened during COVID also was that people went without food. And right now people are, as we come out of COVID and we all are so overjoyed, there's many people right now 
who, based on the fact that we're not sharing the abundance within our country, are going to be homeless because they couldn't pay their rent during the time that they were, uh, um, when there was an, an eviction moratorium. And now those evictions are starting to be put into place. Um, so how, how, how are we as a country going to handle the number of people who are not going to be able to maintain their well-being in terms of uh, keeping themselves in a safe space as well as their children? We need to also redefine safety, justice, and threats. If we are, if we are afraid of Black people, then we need to acknowledge why we are. Um, this is something that really developed during the Reconstruction era, and, and uh, also um, there's been many a film that has really reinforced it. But also there's been people who have been in a space where their well-being has been compromised and they are really always looking for a space for them to be able to be better. Uh, and therefore they also are in a space where they feel that anger is one way to survive um, because they haven't had the opportunities that many of us have had to be in a space where we feel comfortable and able to express ourselves in ways that we won't be judged and seen as a threat. So we need to really, really redefine how we view safety, how we view, we view justice, and how we will handle future, uh, future threats or threats of people. We need to repair harm and embark on what I consider a truth and re reconciliation process. We need to acknowledge what does slavery really do in this country? One of the things that is really important about the, the whole idea of what slavery did, and um, if you haven't been to the Smithsonian's museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, now that the world is opening up again and we can travel. If you get to DC, I would really recommend you go through that museum because it, you're, you're, you're met with a plaque that I'm gonna read from that I, I've always wanted like, to share with people that is a reality of this world. The lives and labor of enslaved African Americans transformed the United States into a world power, yet they received no recognition or payment for what they created. By 1860, 4 million enslaved people produced well over 60% of the nation's wealth and the slave trade value then at $27 billion. Selling an enslaved person proved ready cash, explaining in part why roughly 600,000 people were sold in the domestic slave trade. This vast wealth in human affected the entire nation. This is the, this is the United States via the Smithsonian acknowledging that the, the capitalism and democracy that this country is able to embrace and live through every day was created under the burden or uh, the manpower, person power of those who were enslaved from Africa, um, as well as those who have been imprisoned, imprisoned in camps, uh, particularly the Asians who were Japanese who were in internment camps. Um, there's been many of person who um, who are Latin, uh, Mexican, who have been treated very unfairly as well. Um, so we can go down the list, but there's people who have contributed to this country who were not able to receive the same pleasure or the same privilege of citizenship. Um, so again, truth and reconciliation is something we need to think about. We need to rebuild trust and relationships between groups, and I'm really am very thankful and appreciative of this group tonight. Um, inviting me as a Black person to speak at this meeting, but also I know that you're very embracing of all races and cultures and religious, religions, which is really great. And I think this is a type of work that needs to be done. We need to build collective power amongst those who have been marginalized by gender and race and class. And we also need to really, in my opinion, um, bring dignity, wholeness, and humanity to everyone. Um, one of the things that we really felt that the um, series was going to do for PBS, and I, I worked with two other colleagues, Jackie Hunt and Solomon, um, uh, who was a, a young one of our, who was our youngest person on the panel. We really wanted to have people see a view of what it means by race, particularly Black people for this part of the series. What does it mean to be Black in Wisconsin? What does it mean to be Black in this world? And, and why race matters is because race is such a defining part of who we are. Um, I mean, I, want to ask, I would ask a question of everyone here. When you see someone, what is, you immediately, if I could be wrong, but people generally have an opinion of someone just by first looking at them for their race or for their gender. Is it, it, may not, it may be unconscious, it may be purposeful, it may not be. But we all have some, we all have been unfortunately trained or uh, unconsciously thought, been made to think about how do we view race? And either through, and one, thing that, one of the things I do with my students 
uh, in class is I asked them, how did, how did you first learn about race? How did you even decide that people were different by race? What do you think about the city of Madison versus the city of McConaughey uh, or, or, or Wauwatosa? Like, what do you, what comes to your mind when you think of those places? And know you, you, what comes to your mind is based on a variety of things, either through your family discussions or through your religious uh, upbringing or through your friends. But again, I think that the one thing I, I always like to say to people is that it's really important to not just judge people for who, what you know, but to really think about who they are and learn about them individually. Um, and, and in my work uh, also as a, as a researcher, the one thing I do is I study black men and have been studying black men now for 25 years. And the one thing I have found, and this is there's a study that shows of all the men who are, who are involved as parents, black fathers are the most involved fathers in our country. Uh, and that's research from the federal government um, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, did this study um, in 20, 2013 or 2012, the study was done. But you often don't hear that discussed, that study talked about. And it's not because it's not there an involved father through their finances, because unfortunately, many Black men do not have the privilege of jobs or employment, um, but they do have the privilege of where they can do other things for their children. Um, which I think is really important. And that was the, really the emphasis of our, our work for PBS is that we wanted people to see that black people do so many things are involved in so many things from farming. Um, in Wisconsin, there's black farmers who we don't hear about who are very engaged in farming. There's black people in this, in this, in this city who are very engaged in dance, who are very engaged in also some social welfare programs and nursing and, and, access to, and providing access to healthcare. In closing, I really want to say that I think this is really important, and I, I know this, this should be some time to have some questions and answers, and I want to just make this kind of brief, but I really just think it's important. One of the things I always say to people is that unless we decide to really reach out and make it better for those who have been marginalized, we, we, all, don't, we all will never benefit from the privilege of being a human in this world, of being someone who, can take, who is able to take full advantage of what it means to live a very full and wonderful life. Um, and I, I hope that in our discussion, we have some, you know, we hear some, I get to hear, you know, your questions, but also your thoughts about just what, what does it mean to be someone who thinks of race? And, and what are some of your thoughts about how we can move forward to eliminating some of the in, in, um, un unacceptable practices within our country for those who are black and brown? I thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to a hopefully back in an open discussion for a few minutes that we have left. Thank you so much, Dr. Pate. This was really wonderful and um, so important. Um, I want to ask everybody if you have questions for Dr. Pate, please type them in the chat and I will read them. And while you all gather your thoughts or, or uh, take the, how much time it takes you to type, um, I'm going to start us off. Um, your talk raised so many questions and so many important issues that I wanted to focus on, um, but I want to start with um, talking about reparations. This is something yeah. that we're starting to look at, um, and I, personally, I've heard several different presentations um, recently uh, about reparations, and I know um, the city of Evanston recently passed uh, what they called a reparations bill, and the one African American on the Evanston Council voted against it mm -hmm. um, because she thought it was, while well meaning, didn't really get at what needed to happen. And as she said, wasn't really a reparations bill, it was a housing bill. Um, and so I wanted to um, get some insights from you about when you think about reparations, what does that mean to you, and what, what would you want to see happen? from individuals, from cities, from our federal government? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just started, I don't know whether you are familiar with the book From Here to, In, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century by Will, William Darity and Kristen Mullen. Um, I would highly recommend everyone get this book. Um, I just started reading it, so I have to admit my thoughts on reparations is just really being somewhat formed, but I do think that um, the reparations, let me see, if I go back, when you think about this 40 acres and a mule, that was, I learned, I just learned recently, that was a real thing, that Black people were supposed to actually get 40 acres and a mule up in, during Reconstruction. 
And so it's, it's almost if we, if we want to look at any reparations, people should be getting what opportunities their colleagues got. That would be reparations for me. But it's really looking at what this book talks about is we can never really ever give back or get what people need dating all the way back to post-slavery. But we can't, but those who are descendants of slaves in this country um, should get something because the, the, our, our wealth gap is so wide. And the wealth gap is so wide is because those, some, if, if you read Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, some people have had 500 years to be where they at, where they're at economically based on their family's legacy. But when you look at Black people who have been enslaved, they've had a hundred years to be where they're, to be, to be like their counterparts. And in order for us to be in a space where we're just like our counterparts, we need to have something that allows us to get to that space. Um, and that, that's what I, I, so I think some type of access to, I don't know whether it's money, I don't know whether it's land, I don't know if it's a home, um, but there should be something that allows people to be able to move to a space where they're maybe not the, maybe not me, but maybe my kids' kids would be able to get something to help them to be able to start closing this wealth gap, which is way too far apart. Thank you. Somebody put a question in the chat, was, which was another thing that I wanted to ask you about. Um, so I'm glad that this is on other people's radar as well. Uh, how do we counter the current political efforts to prevent the teaching of critical race theory, even at the university level here in Wisconsin? Well, yeah, I, I just was on NPR talking about that this week or this week. Was it this week? Oh, so anyway, was, the days are starting to flow together because <laughs> we're always on screen. But um, I was just talking about that. And I said the unfortunate part is that people don't even understand what critical race theory is. And that's why I really wanted to talk about the simple statement of what critical race theory is, is looking, I, I think that one, we have to be brave enough to not worry that we might lose our job for saying what critical race theory is. Um, two, we have to educate people on what it means. You don't teach critical race theory, it's a theory. You can teach it, that's for sure, but you're not going into K through 12 teaching, this is what critical race theory is. You're, you're giving people history, you're telling them the truth, you tell them based on what's documented, like I told you tonight, that there was chattel slavery, that there was a law that said people were not human, that people were not, and, they, and there was a law that says people were three-fifths of a human. That is the reality. Whether people are don't want to hear that because it makes them sad, well, unfortunately, parts of our story is sad. There's many people, and as recently as even some of the things that unfortunately happened in other parts of the world and seeing death but there, we, you have you can't people can shut it off but if want, the more we are not willing to have a conversation the longer we're going to be in the space where we're in a divided space and we have to have these real conversations because the whole idea that this is not america all i've heard this year, that is america is that america is a lot of things but that's america too what we what we see consistently around death black black and brown and asian death that's real and I think we have to acknowledge where is that coming from? And it comes from fear that has been really instituted over historical time. And that's critical race theory. And I, I just think that, um, and some people like, like myself, we were, I was just gonna keep doing what I was gonna do because that's what, something that as a professor I'm supposed to do. Um, even when they said we're not supposed to do that. And I think it's unfortunately ridiculous that we're in this space right now. Yes, thank you, I agree. <laughs> Um, so I, I want to thank Professor Lowe who put an explanation in the chat if, for people who, um, if anybody doesn't know what was um, happening in Evanston, um, she gave us a good explanation. Um, another question that came in, what does reconciliation look like? What can one individual do to reconcile some of our racial history? You know, the one thing I, I always say to my friends, white, white friends and black friends too, or anybody, is that, you know, the one way we can reconcile this whole issue of racial history is know the truth, read a book, <laughs> you know, people don't read, um, but they should. One, also, I would highly recommend um, this week, uh, Imbram, Imbram Kendi came up with a podcast, and it's really good. It talks about what, it, like he talked about today, um, we use the word racist too freely now, and we're, he said he's nervous that the, the, the power of the term racist is gonna be lost because everybody calls 
not everybody, but many people call everything racist. Well, in the society we live in, we have a lot of racist ideals that are being perpetuated. And for that reason, you can, you might, you, you can, you can say some, some practices are racist, but not every single thing that happens to you is a racist issue or a microaggression. And I agree with him that I think that some of the power, what it really means to be a racist or what is racism, it's gonna be lost so people don't even know. And the racism doesn't mean I hate white people. It does, that's not what it means. And that's the other part he talked about. And I, he did it much more eloquently than I'm saying right now because I was listening to it earlier today. Um, but I really recommend if people wanna share something with their friends, recommend a podcast like Ingram Kindies and Ma Ma Malcolm Gladwell is doing that just started to, just started yesterday, as a matter of fact, and they have two episodes on it. Um, and it's really very good. I'm gonna require it for my students. Um, this is as we look at just the whole idea of social welfare policy and who has access and who doesn't and why by race. Um, because unfortunately, when we think about black and brown people, when we think about social welfare policy, it's, it's racialized. And that's, for, and that's why people are always so against having more food stamps and more TANF and more other and other types of benefits because everyone thinks that the majority of people who use those benefits are black when we live in a country that's majority white and you can only have majority white people using services because white people are poor too and white people need services too um, but we think of it as only black people but the majority of people who use those services are white thank you um, so um, one of my board members, Vicki Berenson, very helpfully, thank you, Vicki, put some URLs in the chat for um, uh, WPR piece on uh, the Urban League um, buying, uh, buying and reselling homes to boost Black ownership and a piece in Madison 365 on a similar topic. Um, and somebody asked Dr. Pate for the name of the book that you recommended. So I can put oh, the name the of the book is From Here to, e From Here to Equality is Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Um, this is by Darity, uh, William Darity and uh, Kristen Mullen, Mullen, M-U-L-L-E-N, and Darity, D-A-R-I-T-Y. Another book that I'm gonna recommend for the audience, uh, for the group tonight, if they're interested, is this book called 400 Souls, um, which I've read and is also an audible book. And it's really about the 400 years of Black people. I mean, um, when people say black history, I'm always correct. I always wanna say, yeah, it's about black Americans, but this is American history. It just focuses on one group of people. So we need to really understand is yeah, that you may call it black history, but it's really American history. But America is a portion of people who live in America and what their life has been like. But that's another book I would highly recommend. If you wanna figure out what can you do to talk about race, th mm -hmm. this is a book that you definitely could read and share with friends or even and it's so simple to even pull out one or two chapters of it and have a book club or have a reading on it. It's very, very accessible. And a mm -hmm. great, it's a great book to listen to because I listened to it and I went through the whole book in like a week. So it was perfect. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, and I want to let people know that uh, on Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice website and on our blog, there is a resource on, um, uh, anti-racism uh, books and movies and webinars and podcasts and all kinds of things. Um, and I'm going to add uh, these resources, thank you, um, uh, to the list. Um, I don't see any other questions, um, but we, we will definitely be continuing this conversation. And um, we thank you so much. Uh, for sharing with us tonight. And I do want to encourage everybody, if you have not watched Wisconsin PBS's um, Why Race Matters, please do. Um, you will, through that series, meet all kinds of amazing people uh, who do all kinds of work um, throughout our community. And um, it's a great series. And we really appreciate the work that you and Angela Fitzgerald and others have put into uh, creating that series. Well, and thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm sorry Angela couldn't be here. I, I wish I could be as popular as Angela, but she's a great person. And uh, I, hopefully I did, did her justice, but thank you so much for inviting me tonight. I really appreciate it. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to introduce um, our next presenter and um, we are um, incredibly delighted to welcome um, Professor Patty Lowe and to present her 
with our Voice for Justice Award. Um, we present this award every year uh, to an individual or to an organization who is dedicated to social and economic justice and to lifting up the voices of those who too often go unrepresented. Dr. Lowe is a professor at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University and is also an emeritus professor at UW-Madison. Um, Patty is a documentary producer, a former broadcast journalist in public and commercial television. Uh, she is a citizen of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe and is the author of four books on Native American tribes in Wisconsin. Uh, she has produced many documentaries for public and commercial television, including The Way of the Warrior, which aired nationally on PBS in 2007 and again in 2011. And her work right now um, is focusing uh, on outreach to Native American youth and to digital storytelling. And so we are delighted to present her with our Voice for Justice Award and most especially to hear about her work tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Lowe. Thank you, Bonnie. I am so pleased to be here. Um, you know, I wanted to start uh, by talking about um, the Ojibwe Four Orders of Creation. Um, the, the first order is the physical world, the plants, the animals. Um, I'm sorry, the physical world is rocks and, and water and air and earth. Um, the next level are, is the plants and the plants are dependent on the physical world, but the physical world isn't dependent on the plants. The next order of creation is the animals who are dependent on both the plants and the, the elements, but that dependency doesn't go upward, it goes downward. And then finally, there are the human beings who are the most dependent. And as my elders have described it to me, the relationship that we have with plants and animals and the water and the, the earth and the air um, are really the first treaties we ever negotiated. Um, and it, it, it explains why that relate those relationships, those treaties are more important to us than any negotiations we ever had with a state or federal government. And it also explains why Native people are refusing to become sacrifice zones um, and why environmental justice issues are so important to us right now. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and um, Luckily, I'm a former television reporter, so I can tell complex stories in a very short period of time. So um, I just want to hide my little floating controls here. And um, OK, so I thought I would start. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what I've been up to since I've left Madison. Um, but I want to start with this, um, our seventh generation philosophy, because this really has sort of guided me as um, I go about my teaching, my research, and my outreach. So seventh generation thinking is visionary. It, it obligates us to make decisions today that we think will be in the best interest of people seven generations into the future. And so when you think about um, you know, how short-sighted our mainstream society is, our, our political cycles are on, you know, two-year, four-year cycles. Um, our businesses are on quarterly cycles. Um, and the really wicked problems that we have, climate change and um, homelessness and racial inequity uh, are problems that really require self-sacrifice and long-range thinking. So uh, this is what I do at uh, Northwestern University. I, I direct um, a center for Native American and indigenous research. I work with really wonderful people and we're trying to do research that's community framed, community driven and trying to flip the paradigm of, of what research normally looks like um, in academia, which is 
a bunch of scholars get together and identify a grant and uh, get all excited and draft a proposal. And somebody says, hey, look, we can get an extra million bucks if we find a native community or a tribal college to partner with. And so they go looking for a partner and, um, and that community has to twist and contort it in order to fit itself into this, this uh, research project that already has been formed. And so we're, we decided that what we're just going to do is we're going to form relationships. And, um, and that's the way we've approached our, the four years that I've been leading this initiative. We're all about relationship building and getting um, people to trust us. And then we use our resources to serve the communities. We have 11 research and outreach projects right now with Native nations, Native organizations like the American Indian Center in Chicago and um, the Newberry Library, um, Native serving institutions like the Field Museum, the Mitchell Museum of the American Indian, um, Chicago Public Schools. And we're really trying to do community engaged research. Um, then on the teaching side, um, I have always embraced, and this is something that I owe the good people at UW Madison, and a big shout out to the Mortgage, Mortgage um, Center and the good people in the School of Human Ecology who really um, encouraged me to explore experiential learning and service learning. So every, um, every fall, I take my students up to the Oneida Reservation and we help pick, shuck, and uh, shell um, and braid thousands of ears of corn in an, a, a weekend where my students get to hear stories from the elders um, and learn uh, about gift economies. Um, that there's another way uh, to do things, all this corn, none of this corn is sold. It's all given away or bartered. Um, we're, we're involved in a, um, a Newberry Library Archive project. Um, uh, I've connected some of the kids that I work with at Bad River who did a beautiful document, uh, documentary on canoe making and um, the Mitchell Museum will have that as an exhibit. And then um, most recently, we've been working on an indigenous tour of Northwestern. So we have 14 stops on our tour. Um, it, there's a virtual tour available you know, uh, on a website. Um, and there's a GPS guided walking tour, which we launched on Indigenous Peoples Day in 2019. And the purpose of it was to address the invisibility that many of us feel. Um, and it's true whether we live in Madison or Milwaukee or Chicago. Um, you know, you look at, uh, at education reports and you see um, statistics on Latin, Latinx kids and African-American kids and Asian-American kids. And then there's the other category and that's often where we, where we fall. And um, so we identified some really interesting people, places, events that correlated with major um, events in, uh, in history involving Native people. And um, for example, well, first, it's a, what's the story map? It's an interactive approach to storytelling that incorporates maps, texts, images, graphics, audio, video, to provide place-based context to a, a project. So in the story map, you can click on any one of these locations and it'll take you to a location. And for example, um, Northwestern has one of the largest Inuit art collections um, in the country, um, modern art. So there's all provenance, nothing's been, been stolen, no skullduggery involved. Um, one of our locations is um, uh, a professor who conducts a class on maple tapping and climate change. And um, that, you know, that's one of the locations. Um, I worked with 10 students uh, who worked in teams and each of them researched two locations and they stayed within their, their media wheelhouse. Uh, some were oriented toward print or video, infographics. Um, they also were able to choose topics 
um, environmental reporting, sports, social justice, for example. And then um, they recommended additional resources and soundscapes um, for the GPS walking tour. So this maple tapping stop that I mentioned, um, one of my students uh, did a short one minute video. She got so inspired by the class that she, uh, she stayed in her dorm room and uh, made uh, maple, maple syrup, boiled sap all weekend. I didn't think when I came to college that I'd learn to make maple syrup using sap from trees on campus, but that's what I did this quarter in my class called Maple Syrup and Climate Change. We had to filter the sap before cooking it. You could use cheesecloth, but all we had on hand was a t-shirt. We had so much sap, many buckets full, and even more that had been stored and frozen in gallon-sized Ziploc bags. The sap should reach 7 degrees above the boiling point of water, 219 degrees Fahrenheit. You wait until all the excess water is boiled away, and then finally, you have a darker, thicker liquid. It starts to boil a lot. As soon as it hits 219 degrees, you have to remove it from the heat. Otherwise, it will turn into maple sugar and can burn. We stored our syrup in three mason jars. Then, we ate it with small waffles, but since, I've brought my whole jar of maple syrup into the dining hall. It took 10 hours, but I'd definitely do it again. It's just really neat to have this product that we made from the trees. It's much more intimate than maple syrup bought at the store. So in this tour, there are uh, stops like this. Um, I didn't think. Uh, there are stops like this uh, at each of the 14 locations. Um, the other thing that I do that I'm gearing up to do this summer is to work on uh, our tribal youth media initiative. And this was something um, and I, again, I want to give a shout out to the mortgage um, folks because they provided seed money for the initial grant um, and allowed me to bring some colleagues up to uh, various Indian reservations in northern Wisconsin and work with middle school and high school kids teaching digital storytelling. And let me tell you, there is nothing more gratifying than seeing a teenager with a camera and a microphone in her hand and the, um, the, you know, when you see a, a young person find their voice and um, I've, I've worked with some amazing kids. One of the unfortunate statistics is that a lot of our native youth disproportionately wind up being labeled learning disabled and special ed. And um, I've worked with kids who uh, have 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 won national awards for their documentaries. They um, the they they're empowered by the digital storytelling process, and I'm I'm happy to say that um, that three three of the kids that were labeled um, as being somehow deficient wound up graduating from college uh, last year. So I want to show you a couple of the excerpts from some of their their. Uh, videos. It's about uh, maybe three minutes or so, and and I'll I'll end with this little video. Um, this is the um, the production that I'm most proud of. Um, these three 14 year olds did a half an hour documentary um, about taconite mining, and their film was instrumental in helping the community um, turn back this mining threat. Um, the kids researched history, culture, ecology, geology, hydrology, chemistry. They produced, they shot, wrote, narrated, edited the entire project. Um, uh, they even composed their own original music, which you'll hear in the, um, in the pieces that I'm gonna show. And, and this particular documentary won three national awards, uh, including um, a major award at the Human Rights Film Festival. And these kids, they were, were flown down to um, Arizona State University and presented their film to a, a, a audience of 300, mostly professors and graduate students, and uh, who were dropping their jaws listening to these three 14-year-olds talk about complex geology and how the taconite was sandwiched between layers of pyrite and and you know and you all know what happens you know when sulfide hits air or water it creates sulfuric acid and um, I was so proud I, I had to step out and have myself a good cry in the bathroom. I was so proud of these kids. So here's um, a couple of their excerpts. 
All original music compositions. One went on, the man, the young man that composed this music went on to uh, be a music major at UW Eau Claire. That's Jordan Principato. He's taking the pictures. And that's Apane Thomas. He's composing the music. The three of us are making this documentary about mining in the Pinocchio Hills to help educate people. My Norman, if you break that word down, my no, that's that's something good. My then that's the good seed. We had a storm start here Monday night, I believe it was. And that's when I'm not even sure how much water we, we received in the area, but there was enough water to have the Bad River rise beyond its record stages by, I believe, five feet. And by morning, we woke up to uh, multiple bridges were out, culverts and roads were washed away. It's uh, part of an activity to understand the ecosystem uh, and it's a way of determining if, the, if we have a healthy water system or if there's something adversely affecting the water in the area. Um, collecting macroinvertebrates gives us a good understanding of the quality of the water and it's all about water quality and relating that to our culture I mean, and for any culture you need clean environments. It was the, they were collecting macro invertebrates up on the Potato River in northern Wisconsin. And we always like to um, show the kids the credits and we have a video premiere and their parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles can watch their, um, their projects and, and be really inspired and excited. Um, so uh, I saw, I see that uh, I had to upload my, my uh, presentation from one com computer and then download it from another. And I think the video and the audio somehow got unsynced, but you get the, the general idea. I'm so proud of the kids that I work with. And it's really exciting to me to see them, um, these three kids who produced this mining documentary I would go to public hearings and I would see them outside with signs and um, they were really politically active and really found their voice. And uh, it's exciting to me to think about the next generation of storytellers and line stewards. So miigwech, I, I am so pleased to accept this award. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This, your work is amazing. and. Um, uh, I was excited to hear when we spoke the other day that you're coming back to Madison and we can't wait to have you back in our community and um, personally I'm looking forward to uh, to getting to know you better. Um, your work is beautiful. Um, I, I teach 14 year olds also and I know I know they're going into the bathroom crying from how proud you are. <laughs> that, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I want to turn to the, the business portion, portion of our evening, um, but I'm going to be brief. Um, I, I, but I am very proud of the work that we've done this year, and I'm excited to uh, talk to you a little bit about what we have in store for the future. Um, uh, I'm going to be very, very brief, but we do have an annual report that will be going up on our website, hopefully within the next day or two, that you can um, read at your leisure and get more detailed information about what we've been doing and, and uh, see the very many people who make our work possible. Um, I really want to thank our board. Um, we have an amazing board. You've uh, seen some of their work tonight because some of them have been putting helpful things into the chat and I wanna thank you all um, for, for helping me out with that. Um, we also um, really need to thank uh, our donors and supporters. Um, and this is our, our list of board members. Um, we have slots open on our board if anybody's interested in joining our board, um, please be in touch with me. Um, our, our donors and supporters, individual donors and uh, foundations, we could not do our work without them. I want to 
uh, particularly give a shout out to Kathy and Tim Mazur, who in the last uh, two years have been incredibly generous and uh, their, their uh, contributions have been game changing uh, in terms of our being able to have paid staff for the first time ever. Uh, and um, we really thank them for their tremendous support uh, and for all of you out there who, who donate and contribute and volunteer and uh, help us out in so many ways. Um, we um, have so many volunteers uh, who have been working with us uh, over the years. And um, this year, I particularly want to uh, talk about some of our volunteers who have helped with our interfaith community building work, with planning our iftar, our, our interfaith Ramadan break the fast, which last year and this year had to be online uh, because of COVID. We're looking forward to having it again in person next year. And anybody who wants to work on that, please let me know. Um, really want to uh, lift up the work of Mary Strait, who has been tireless in uh, working on our sacred site visits. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about what that uh, consists of in, in a few minutes. Um, and Marsha Vandercook, who did tremendous work around uh, our civic engagement work um, and volunteers who are helping us with our COVID-19 outreach um, and so many other people who are working on our Dane Sanctuary Coalition Steering Committee, the Dignity at Work Steering Committee, uh, other committees of Dane Sanctuary. Uh, again, you'll read all their names in um, our annual report, which are on our, which will be on our website shortly. Um, but I want to um, uh, also uh, our member congregations um, so if you are a congregation or an organization, uh, our dues are minimal, uh, but your support is invaluable. Uh, and we really want to thank um, those congregations and organizations that uh, are members of uh, Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice. Um, Daniel, you want to advance the slide a little bit? There we go. There's our, our member congregations and organizations. Um, thank you so much. For, for all your support and help over the years. So we've been working very hard this year. One of the things that we've been engaged in, uh, we're in the second year of our Wisconsin Interfaith Voter Engagement Campaign. Uh, in 2020, we worked to get out the vote, to get people registered, um, to get as many people to the polls as possible. And as part of that work, we recruited clergy uh, who went to the polls uh, uh, during the November election to work as poll chaplains to help keep um, people friendly, uh, to help keep people calm, to make sure that people didn't get frustrated waiting in long lines, uh, and just to, to be there. We were, had also recruited people to be poll watchers and poll workers. And this year, the Wisconsin Faith Voter Engagement Campaign is really focusing on combating our voter suppression bills that are in our legislature right now, uh, uh, advocating for fair maps and against the gerrymandering that um, has afflicted our state, uh, and training people on how to be advocates around the state budget and other issues that you care about. Um, we, uh, along with Worker Justice Wisconsin, have received a grant from the Department of Health Services to help promote trust in the COVID-19 vaccine, particularly in the African-American and Latinx communities. And um, we've been uh, um, partnering with the Urban League, with Centro Hispano, Voces de la Frontera, the Latino Health Council, other organizations um, to do vaccine clinics and to take photos. Uh, of people to post on social media to help promote trust in the vaccine and been um, uh, disseminating flyers with FAQs about the vaccine to try to uh, bust some of the myths around the vaccine and to help build trust. Um, our interfaith community organizing um, this year has focused on our sacred site visits. We did them uh, in person in 2019. In 2021, we pivoted to doing them virtually um, and so um, we have some videos up on our YouTube channel from some of our sacred site visits. We've been uh, to Circle Sanctuary uh, where Reverend Selena Fox hosted us and talk, talked to us about nature religion. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Beitch uh, hosted us for a virtual Passover experience. Uh, we've been to um, 
the uh, Hindu temple in Madison. We've been to Tippecanoe Presbyterian Church in Milwaukee and the Milwaukee Zen Center. Um, so while pivoting to the digital world has been a challenge, it's also actually been great that we've been able to go places outside of Dane County and have people participate from all over Wisconsin and even outside of Wisconsin. So um, we're planning on going back to in-person starting next week uh, with our visit to the sick community in Middleton, but we are committed to also continuing to offer a virtual option so that people from all over can participate in um, these sacred site visits. Um, our iftar, our Ramadan break the fast, as I mentioned, uh, pivoted to being online last year and this year and focused on fundraising for Second Harvest Food Bank. Uh, and we raised um, over $3,500 uh, for Second Harvest this year. So we were glad during this pandemic when so many people are going hungry um, that we were able to make that contribution. Uh, and again, we look forward to next year to having our iftar in person again. Um, we have um, been uh, also focusing on um, uh, racial justice work and anti-racism. We, uh, through our Dignity at Work Coalition, we've been offering uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings to our Dignity at Work members. We're going to be offering anti-racism training in the fall to members of our two clergy groups uh, in focused in Dane County and in the greater Milwaukee area and also to other clergy around the state. So we're excited to be able to offer that work as well. Um, we have so much going on um, uh, around um, all of these initiatives and more. Um, we are starting a racial justice coalition uh, in partnership with First Baptist Church and other uh, congregations and organizations and in partnership with the Wisconsin Council of Churches who also partner with us on, Wis on the Wisconsin Interfaith Voter Engagement Campaign and so many other things. Um, we're grateful to them and to all of our partner organizations that we work with on all these different fronts. Um, there's so much more to talk about. As I said, please visit our website. Um, our annual report will be up shortly. Um, also really wanna give a shout out to Tiffany Hudson, our communications consultant who created our new website. Please visit it. It is beautiful um, and chock full of information about all of the work that we do. Um, and um, to Sarah Gilday, our development uh, director who has helped us so much this year uh, to increase our funding um, and has uh, worked tirelessly on tonight's event. Uh, and I so much again, wanna thank all of our presenters. I'm so grateful to you all for all the work that you do and for your willingness to share it with us tonight. Uh, so I know I talked really, really fast. Um, I'm from New York, I know how to do that. Um, but uh, so I'm going to turn it over now to the president of our board, Larry Sexy, to uh, uh, close us out and then um, to Professor, uh, to, to Reverend Baring for our closing prayer. Larry. Larry, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, my wife wishes I had a mute button. Um, you've heard our executive director, Rabbi Bonnie, talk about just some of the successes of Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice during what has been a very challenging year. But these accomplishments, which are many, are only possible because of the incredible, generous support of you, our donors. And it's gratifying to see many of you are here with us tonight virtually. This has been a challenging year for our country. COVID-19 seized upon America's inequity and hugely magnified it. We face challenges like systemic racism, voter suppression, police brutality, the ongoing crisis at our border, and an extreme partisan divide which polarize us. Yet at this time, I am tremendously proud to be board president of an organization which continues to mobilize interfaith communities and individuals of conscience and goodwill to act on all these fronts. We are standing up against voter suppression. We are advocating for racial justice and unity. We're connecting different faith communities with each other so that they can magnify their work. We're creating a strong interfaith network that has the power to make real change. 
And yet there's much more to be done. This moment must not pass us by, but instead serve as a catalyst for real, meaningful, lasting change. To create that change, we need to expand our outreach. We're using tonight's celebration to raise $10,000 to fund a regional director for Greater Milwaukee. It's imperative we expand our work, deepen relationships, and connect with new congregations and organizations in Milwaukee. And you can allow us to accomplish this. All gifts that are given during this next week will be matched dollar for dollar up to $5,000, but that's only for this one week. So I'm asking you to join me in making a gift. You can give online at Wisconsin Voices, at Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice.org, all one word, and click donate to WFVJ, or you can do the old fashioned thing and send a check to that address, which is listed on our website. I can promise you that your gift of any amount will help us to continue our work together to create real and lasting change. Um, Bonnie has thanked all of you for being present this evening. I've been overwhelmed by um, your support. Um, I, I, my life has been enriched by the people that I have met through this organization. Um, and one of those, um, one of the founding members of what was not even called Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice, but was a social justice initiative. Um, Reverend Joe Baring is with us to conclude tonight by offering us good words. Reverend Joe. Thank you, Larry. Let us pray. Father, for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our minds have absorbed tonight, we thank you. For the Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice engagement in social justice issues, Father, we thank you. As they continue their work, Father, we pray your strength to sustain them, your wisdom to enable them, your hand to protect them, and your spirit to guide them. Now, Father, bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us now and forevermore let every person say amen amen thank you all so much thank you for being here tonight thank you to our presenters thank you to all of our volunteers uh and um to those of you who have uh, made donations i'm incredibly grateful uh your support uh, for our work is uh, invaluable in so many different ways, uh, not just financially, but just in spirit. Uh, so thank you all and um, have a wonderful rest of your evening. <laughs>